Valyria was not the first to conquer the world. In the dawn of days, the city of Geese opened its gates and poured forth its legions across the continent of Essos. With their lockstep discipline and absolute obedience, they ground entire nations beneath their boots and planted the harpy in every corner of the known world. What they didn't destroy, they chained. Slavery is as old as man, but until the Giscari, it was never an art. The slave lords grew rich and fat as pyramids were raised around them, pleasure houses were filled, and fighting pits were open. Nobody remembers if the waters around Geese had names before the Empire, but ever since, we know them only as Slaver's Bay and the Gulf of Grief. Of Geese, however, nothing remains but ruins, where end all great civilizations. 5,000 years ago, Valyrian shepherds stumbled on strange eggs, and within a few generations, an upstart Valyrian freehold rose across the sea. Five times did the Giscari contend with Valyria, and five times did they go down in defeat. For the Freehold had dragons, and the Empire had none. The best of their legions burned, the others broke. The brick walls of Geese were pulled down, the streets and buildings turned to ash, and the very fields sown with salt, sulfur, and skulls. Yet the Empire was not wholly destroyed. Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine, once lowly colonies along Slaver's Bay, survived and even thrived. Valyria had watched the Giscari grow rich and powerful off the backs of conquered peoples, and now the self-styled Freehold wanted its turn. While the Dragon Lords brought the world to heel, the slave markets of their former enemy never lacked for flesh. Lamenting the lost empire, the descendants of old geese grew rich and fat. The doom fell on Valyria, and the Dothraki rose to pillage most of the continent at will. But gold-laden Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine continue as they have for thousands of years, untouched. For even the horse lords understand what the Giscari taught Valyria so long ago. What good are slaves without slavers? When the doom claimed Valyria, the great freehold fractured into warring cities and upstart nations, ripe for the taking. Out of the east swarmed the Dothraki, the horse lords of the plains who feared only defeat and dragons. And now the dragons were all gone. Under the great Karl Temu, they sacked and burnt every town and city in their path. No army could stand against them, because the Dothraki do not stand. The Horse Lords do not draw up battle lines or hide behind shield walls or layer themselves in armor. The Dothraki charge. Their blades are more scythe than sword, the better to cull the infantry ranks without breaking stride. Even their archers fire from horseback so that advancing or retreating, the arrows never cease. To the Dothraki, a man who does not ride is no man at all, without honor or pride. When the city of Kohor realized Karl Temu was coming, they strengthened their walls, doubled their own guards, and hired two full companies of sellswords. The Dothraki were used to glorified farmers with spears. Kohor would show them a proper army, with mounted and armored cavalry to match the horde's own. As an afterthought, the city leaders sent an envoy to Astapor to buy Unsullied. The slavers had always claimed that the Unsullied were the great Giscari legions come again. Few cared. The dragon-burned ruins of old Geese were a stark reminder that the age of the foot soldier was over. The envoy had his orders, however, and quickly bought 3,000 Unsullied for the long march back. For Unsullied do not ride. But while they marched, Karl Temu arrived at Quohor. I can imagine how pleased the Karl was to finally face a challenge. By the end of the battle, crows and wolves feasted on what remained of Quohor's heavy horse. All the sellswords had fled. Quohor knew that the Dothraki would very soon break through the gates to rape, slave, and burn at their pleasure. Yet the next day, Karl Temo woke to find, before the gates, 3,000 eunuchs in formation armed with only spears, shields, and spiked helms. 
The Unsullied had slipped past the Kull's army in the night while the Dothraki feasted. Kull Temu had many times their number and could easily have flanked the small force. But to the Dothraki, men on foot are fit only to be ridden down. Eighteen times the Horse Lords charged, and eighteen times the Unsullied locked their shields, lowered their spears, and held the line against twenty thousand Dothraki screamers. When the Kull's archers rained arrows on them, the Unsullied lifted their shields above their heads until the squall passed. And then they held the line. In the end, only 600 Unsullied remained, but more than 12,000 Dothraki lay dead, including Karl Temu and all his sons. The new Karl led the survivors past the city gates, where one by one, each man cut off his braid and threw it down before the feet of the Unsullied. Defeated and shamed forever. Since that day, the Unsullied fill the ranks of cities and households wealthy enough or desperate enough. Cell swords fight for gold, knights for glory, and Dothraki for blood. To a man, the Unsullied fight only to obey. With the right master over them, imagine how the forces of chaos would break against their shields. The conquerors, the madmen, the usurpers. Done then. They belong to me. Tindas Lisa Ser Tida. Tida. This is done. Well, she's done me. You hold the whip. Sparrow Zia. Zia Zantir. Great masters of marine, as if calling themselves such could make them so. Thousands of years ago, during the height of the Giscari Empire, marine was second only to old geese in wealth and glory. A paradise by the sea, if one didn't mind the constant clinking of chains and cracking whips. Slaves built marine, and on their backs the city rested like a litter. Then came the dragons of Valeria, 
The masters of old Guise would not bow, so they burned. The Valyrians tore down their walls, burned their pyramids to ash, and sowed their fields with salt and skulls. An old slave woman once told me that the Valyrians intended to break the chains of the Cascari slaves, absorbing them into the Valyrian freehold where every man held a vote. But the great masters of Marine received their new overlords in the great temple, plying them with gold, wine, and all the wealth that slavery had brought them. And the Valyrians instead took up the whip themselves. I do not believe it. As their empire expanded, the Valyrians needed more and more bodies to feed their mines and colonies, when no wage could ever tempt a free man. The great masters merely accommodated their new customers, staying rich as the Giscari Empire crumbled. After the doom fell on Valyria, the great masters worried for their fortunes. By this time, the Valyrians were their greatest providers and purchasers of slaves. Then the Dothraki horse lords swept out of the plains of Essos and proved to be as fond of slaving as the dragon lords before them. The great masters grew richer still. For the first time in its history, the great masters alone ruled Marine and chaos ruled the rest of the world. The fighting pits swallowed men who in previous centuries would have filled the ranks of the Valyrian armies. Without these soldiers to maintain order, the wealthy had to buy their own, which the good masters of Astapor were more than willing to sell. If the buyer's nerves still needed calming, the wise masters of Yonkai could sell him further release. The great masters, the good masters, the wise masters, Yet none were so great, good, or wise that they recognized our queen for what she was. Her ancestors had destroyed them, then become them. Perhaps they assumed she would bend as easily. But our queen does not bend. She breaks. Anna Dothrakman, Ayosana Gine. Yeah! <laughs> 